So let's imagine our local friend, Ewan Sullivan. He's from Austin, and he's working for a healthcare startup. Ewan is going on a business trip to Mumbai, and during the midday sun, he wants to <laughs> go somewhere a little shady, um, and by that I mean uh, a nice restaurant where he's going to grab a bite to eat. And um, after he finishes his curry, he goes to the cashier. And he knows that India took out small notes out of circulation, and basically he knows to use his credit card to pay. It's a digital economy, um, and this is what Ewan knows to do. However, the cashier says, sorry, we only take Paytm. And Ewan is a little bit surprised. I mean, um, Paytm is a mobile wallet company. You can use Paytm application to pay for your utilities. You can use it to exchange cash with your friends, and you can obviously pay for your lunch. This is actually not an unusual event in today's emerging markets. You might have heard of the quote uh, from the science fiction author William Gibson. William Gibson once argued that the future is here, however, it's not evenly distributed. And often we tend to think that, okay, well, that probably means that you know, the future is in Silicon Valley, um, but clearly it's not necessarily in um, Eindhoven, Germany, or it might not be in Stockholm, or it might not definitely be in developing markets. Let's take a pause and think about how do we make these mental distinctions. What's a developed economy? Well, a developed economy is probably a place where the economy is well-functional, um, there's free flow of capital into this economy, um, there's uh, access to being a shareholder in the equity in this economy, and probably a high level of income. What about, what do we think is emerging markets? Well, often we think of emerging economies as those places where we're seeing rapid growth, usually through industrialization. And in most cases, these economies are moving through sort of stages of development, and most cases, they actually don't have very high income. This year, however, uh, Brookings just updated their uh, study of the global middle class. And what we're seeing is that, in fact, as of today, already, um, the vastest portion of the global middle class is now shifted to the global markets. And by 2030, Asia will have the largest middle class population in the world. Clearly, the global pattern of wealth distribution has completely changed. You might want to think about why that is, and I have a couple of ideas of what those drivers might be. So um, let me take a step back and tell you a little story. I was um, a child in the 1990s Finland, and of course, back then, um, we all used to have these feature phones. I don't know if any of you remember the Nokias. The Nokias were not only awesome, but one of the reasons they were so awesome is that um, you could just send text messages and, and call your friends. You were not able to connect through applications and to services or anything like that, but it sort of got us talking and got us connected. Today, the Nokia phone is what we would call a product of the third industrial revolution. In 2015, I was at work and I came across this term called the fourth industrial revolution. And I was a little bit confused. I was like, well, what is, what is fourth industrial revolution? It's something about digitization, something about general purpose technologies. Um, it's probably something about having technologies in the human body, but I'm not sure. Um, so let's take a step back. So the first industrial revolution, if we remember it correctly, was the time when people moved from rural areas to the cities. It was the era of the innovation of the steam engine. The second industrial revolution, it happened just before the First World War, and it was characterized in innovations like the light bulb and the telephone. And the third, since the 1980s, probably characterized in those Ericsson and Nokia phones, and really was largely about uh, mainframe computers and bringing um, personal technology to everybody. So what is this fourth industrial revolution? I like to think that the main and the easiest way of characterizing it is that it's about how those general purpose technologies and processes are now being brought to everything. 
So it's not just about having access to mobile and to various services on your smartphone, but it is really about how these technologies are being brought to production systems, the human body, and around the world. So how, how did I become a believer in this fourth industrial revolution? Well, obviously, as a consumer, I realized that one of the key things was that I was now able to book my flights, book my uh, lunch, uh, book anything really on my cellular phone. I was really impressed by the new types of companies that were part of this industrial revolution. We call them platform companies. What's special about platform companies? They're those companies that are largely online-to-online -online platforms. They don't own their supply chains, and they monetize on the transactions between the buyers and sellers on their platforms. I was also impressed by um, what this meant for the trend in investing in technology. In the 1970s, technology investments brought hundreds of billions of dollars to their investors in returns. Today, technology sector investments bring trillions of dollars to investors in this sector. The businesses of this revolution benefit from the incredible decrease in costs in computing and in broadband, and at that, of course, a vastly increasing product profit margin in consequence. But what's curious about how these technologies are performing is that they're actually becoming, A, embedded in different parts of the industrial production process of the human body and of society. And in addition, they actually are not progressing in a linear manner, but they have a systemic effect. And because of the speed and the scope of broadband and computing power around the world, they actually now exist in industries and places around the world, regardless of the geography. So let me go back to my emerging markets, the story that I started off telling with you and Sullivan and, and friends. Here's what I'm suggesting about how we need to reshift how we think about investing in technology sectors, especially in emerging markets, and how the conversation really has changed. Over half of global users of the internet are now in Asia. And here's another fact. Did you know that not only two or three times is the Chinese market the, uh, in mobile payments the size of the US market? It's 50 times. It's 50 times the size of the US market in mobile payments. Whilst the market is huge, you can also see this in enterprise formation within these emerging markets. As in the past, energy, materials, and telecommunications companies used to dominate the MSCI Emerging Market Index. Today, we see that 23% of the 10 largest companies in the MSCI Emerging Market Index are actually technology companies. And if you combine that with the positive trend on consumption, and also a positive trend on inflation, I think it becomes quite clear that this might very well might be a cyclical trend and not really a short-term investment trend. So last week I was in China, and um, being Nordic, I was obviously looking for a bike uh, to get around. I mean, it was a little bit surprising to find these bikes in the cities of Shanghai and Beijing, these mega cities, but I was delighted, of course. And I was asking my friends, like, oh, wow, so, you know, I thought that subways and maybe DD or taxi hailing apps and others would have been incredibly popular in these cities, but in fact, the bikes were everywhere, and they had appeared overnight. Apparently, these bikes, they solved the last mile problem for a lot of the residents and the urbanites in, in China and in these cities. On average, the Beijinger lives one kilometer away from the subway station, and Mobikes, oh awful, or a number of the other startups that have appeared on the market in the past five months have solved that problem. Of course, this is not a regular bike, as you can see. The arrow points out an activity that I had to partake in. I had to dig out my cell phone and download the WeChat app. And I used the WeChat app to scan that QR code to rent this bike for an hour, for one dollar per hour, and drive it from the subway station to my hotel. The bike has an embedded GPS system, so I can just leave the bike next to my hotel and ha don't have to worry about returning it on time or paying more for renting it for a longer period of time. 
but the company hires locals to pick up these bikes and pays them to deliver them at the subway station. Wow, I was impressed. What I was mostly impressed by is that these types of innovations that do two things. A, they deploy the latest technology, technological innovations in uh, GPS precision, in payments, in online-to-online -online mobile applications, and deploy them in the real economy. And in fact, what I learned on this trip was that since 2016, these are the biggest markets. The online-to-offline markets in China are where the opportunity for a fourth industrial revolution technologies are at. So I came away thinking, back to my office, back to working on emerging markets, and realized that we need to change our frame of thinking. The future is here, and it is quite evenly distributed. We need to stop talking and thinking only in terms of the distinction between developed markets and emerging markets, and think about these humongous emergent markets, which is where the opportunity is today. Thanks so much.